Thank you Thank you for the introduction. Um, so this is a joint work together with uh, Robert Gilliam, David Wang, um, Adi Shamir, and Daniel Genkin and Yuval Yerom, which are supposed to be here at least. Um, they'll give a talk uh, in, a few, in about 15 minutes. And uh, the, the very long and elaborate title is The Nine Lives of Black and Bacher's Cat. And it's a new cache attack. Uh, I'm against TLS implementations um, using a very, very old, as we already heard today, um, padding, uh, padding Oracle. Okay, so uh, what we're going to basically talk about is a little bit of uh, background, how we can attack TLS and do downgrade attack. Um, a new uh, way that, uh, method that we have to parallelize um, the original Bachenbacher uh, attack. Um, and then talk a little bit about how we actually, what were the vulnerabilities for the uh, cache attacks, and uh, hopefully some uh, uh, conclusion in the end. Um, so I don't think that we really need to introduce TLS in this session, but I'll still do it. It's uh, probably the most widely used cryptographic uh, protocol in the world. It provides communication security for many purposes. Maybe the most used one is for HTTPS uh, communication on the internet. And it has, we could say, two main uh, parts, the TLS handshake, which is used to authenticate the different parties and to uh, do a secure key exchange, and the TLS record layer that actually encrypts the, uh, the data. And it supports cryptographic agility um, using uh, different uh, cipher suites, which basically says that um, if we uh, learn over the years that some kind of cipher suite that we're using is vulnerable, then we can just deprecate, stop using it, and uh, um, move to newer ones. And as we already seen uh, today, and we'll see here, uh, in theory, um, it might work. In practice, um, theory doesn't work. And cryptographic agility um, also um, help us uh, mainly by uh, allowing the support for ev every uh, possible vulnerable cipher suite that has ever, ever been invented. So um, this is basically the layers of TLS, and we're going to talk about the handshake protocol, um, which is circled, and we're going to talk specifically about RSA key exchange in TLS. And so RSA key exchange uses the uh, infamous PKCS number one version 1.5 padding scheme that we're going to hear a lot about it uh, in the rest of the talk. And it was once maybe, uh, the most popular TLS uh, key exchange option that was used almost by 100% of the, of the TLS connection. However, it has a very, very, very long history of practical implemented text. And history, we're talking about a paper that was um, published last week. Um, the latest one, and I, uh, and I feel that this, uh, this history is going to continue to the future. And, but we already think that uh, there's a large consensus that RSA key change is a bad thing. And um, uh, in part of the, all of the implementation text, it also doesn't support fault, fault secrecy, which is also a main issue. Uh, but still, um, maybe uh, the last time I checked, it was in the end of uh, 2018, it's still widely used. About 6% of the uh, connections on the internet still use uh, RSA key exchange. Uh, and uh, there are much better alternatives that uh, we can use right now but it's still supported for um, maybe the most dangerous thing in cryptography, which is um, backward compatibility. We still need to support those old machines that doesn't know how to use anything else. And this, as we'll see, puts the whole ecosystem of the internet in, in risk. Okay, so um, if we take the large overview of what we did in the paper, we tested uh, nine different implementations for uh, vulnerability to cache attacks uh, and on RSA uh, paddings. And uh, out of those nine, there were two, uh, Boring SSL and VSSL, which were uh, secure. We, would, we couldn't manage and to find any vulnerabilities. And all of the rest uh, had multiple types of uh, vulnerabilities. And we'll talk a bit about the different, um, different types uh, later on. Okay, so um, for now, you'll believe me that we are able to do those, those cache attacks, and then we claim, okay, we broke 6% of the internet, and then you could say, okay, maybe you are in the other 94%, so why do you care about this uh, paper? And the main thing that we want to, uh, to claim is that we show that it might be feasible to do a man-in-the-middle downgrade attack, 
and then um, using our parallelization technique for, uh, for this attack, and assuming that we can do this cache attack against multiple servers, uh, for example, large companies, I don't know, Facebook, Amazon, whatever, has multiple servers to support a large bandwidth. If you can attack them in parallel, then we can um, do uh, this number attack. We use a uh, beast uh, attack to boost the success probability, and then we, ca we claim that we are able to break 100% of the connections that use this uh, vulnerable uh, implementation. Okay, so we'll try to... Um, explain what we, what we did here. So this is RSA encryption. I assume most of you um, have seen it before. And this is a um, nice map. We have uh, prime numbers, we have uh, RSA modulus, we have secret keys, and we can do encryption with that. And, but uh, the question is how we can use this nice map to actually encrypt real world uh, data. And there are several real world problems that we need to overcome in order to really use this. Um, so we'll give a few examples. The first one, let's assume we use uh, a small uh, public exponent, three. It was something that was um, actually used. And we want to encrypt the number 1,000. And we want to be secure, and today the standard is something around 2,048-bit uh, RSA keys. So we have uh, generated a very secure uh, RSA module. Okay, uh, so but we have this problem. Well, if we uh, take 1,000 raised to the power three, uh, we're still much smaller than the modulus. And actually, uh, to calculate uh, the log of this value over the real is something that's not very complicated. Uh, so we need to make sure that m is the number that we encrypt is large enough, so it will be so it will actually go over the value of the modulus. Okay, now another problem. Let's say I want to. Um, to encrypt the information for my application, and my application can answer yes or no to a specific question. So the, it either encrypts the value of zero or one. So this is vulnerable to dictionary attack. It basically means if I encrypt the value zero multiple times, you can see that it's the same value each time, and it's easy to detect repetitions. Uh, so in order for our scheme to be secure, we need the value m that we encrypt to also be random. Okay. so. Here is PKCS number one, version 1.5, to the rescue. And what it uh, does is basically um, uses a padding scheme to pad and then encrypt the plain text. And what it does, it basically pads the plain text to the RSA key length to make sure that the number is big enough, and it adds the randomization. Okay, so this is the example of what is done in um, TLS uh, 1.2. Basically, we start with an encrypt encryption preamble. It's two bytes, zero and two, that states this is um, this is an uh, encryption process. Then we have um, eight random non-zero bytes. This makes sure that the number is random and also uh, the number is uh, large enough. We have a delimiter, uh, zero delimiter, because in the general scheme we don't know what is the actual size of the plain text that we want to encrypt, although in TLS we do know it. And in TLS we have 48 bytes of the actual uh, pre-mastered secret that is uh, generated by the client and sent to the server. Okay, so um, we have, now we have uh, what we call Blechenbacher's uh, attack, and it's a very old attack from 1998, and it's an adaptive chosen uh, ciphertext, and what it does, it exploits the strict manner in which RSA uh, PKSS uh, padding is done. And uh, actually what we have is we have this uh, innocent uh, client, he sends this ciphertext to the server, and we have the uh, malicious attacker, he listens to the, uh, to the ciphertext, and then he uses the same server as an oracle, and uh, basically what he does, he sends the, he, uh, he changed the ciphertext, he sends a mild, uh, mild uh, uh, version of the ciphertext to the server, and then, um, he checks with the server, does this, uh, the plain text that corresponds to this ciphertext, does it start with zero two or not? And uh, with this response, you can continue the, the attack. This is an adaptive attack. And in the end, it is able to decrypt it. And there is also a very similar attack that's um, from 2001 uh, by Manga, uh, which is aimed at another, padding, another newer padding scheme. By the way, I want to take, uh, thank uh, people in the audience here for this uh, wonderful slide. 
Okay, so uh, we have this uh, amazing uh, Blachenbacher attack, and we're not going to go into uh, all of the details of the matter, although this is a really uh, beautiful paper in my opinion. I highly recommend people to read it. Uh, it was an attack that was used to be called the million message attacks because you need about a million messages, the million queries to the server in order to decrypt the message. So this is a quite a large number, but in general the exact performance is dependent on the very specific properties of the oracle that, uh, that we have. So we can actually get it in much less than one million messages in some cases. But uh, for this talk, what the main thing that I want you to remember is that the attack is adaptive chosen ciphertext, and which means that no matter how lucky we are and what kind of optimization we are able to do, uh, if we want to decrypt the 2048-bit uh, RSA key, we need 2048 sequential uh, Oracle queries. There's no way to go around it. Okay, so uh, what is the goal of uh, our attack? The goal of our attack is, is in uh, most things in life, we want to get cookies. And the reason we want to get cookies because this is a very efficient way to get the user's uh, data. The session cookies is what enables us to um, connect to our uh, to, to web server without re-inputting re the password in each connection. So it, um, it's very comfortable for the user. And uh, it gives, if you got a session cookie, then you can get access to the, to the web server and then you can download all of the a victim's emails or information, you don't really need to try to decrypt each and every TLS communication that the client makes. And the, those cookies are sent in the beginning of each TLS connection. And so we have this attack scenario for this RSA key exchange. We're going to sniff, to sniff one TLS handshake and the first message that is sent by the client. And then we're going to use um, Blechenbacher to decrypt uh, a pre-master uh, secret. And uh, after we get this, the pre-master secret, we can decrypt the first message, and then we get a cookie. So all right, uh, it's very simple, very elegant attack. And this is how it's done if we have, uh, in the case of cache um, timing side channel. So uh, in our example, we have um, uh, a bank that has, uh, that has a very secure uh, HTTPS uh, server, and it runs it on a very, very secure uh, cloud uh, service provider. And we have Mr. Smiley here. Mr. Smiley wants to connect to the bank. The Cookie Monster um, listens to the stiff the communication. And afterwards, the Cookie Monster starts to do the Blachenbacher attack. And uh, it gets the keys. And uh, excuse me, for that we have the uh, Arquette cache attacker. He runs on, a, on the same hardware inside the cloud, but on different uh, virtual machine or different process. And he is able to uh, measure the cache side channels. So uh, we have the cookie monster, it cooperates with the cat, and they're able to retrieve the cookies. Okay, so um, this is something that's relatively uh, simple, but uh, we are uh, very greedy people, and, we are, and also the cookie monster is very greedy, and we want to have all of the cookies. Okay, so 6% of the connection is not enough for us. So what we want to do is we want to use um, the RSA key exchange for uh, a downgrade attack. Basically, um, what we want to do is to um, attack, um, um, attack a connection using um, a thermal diffie or some newer uh, cipher suite and cause it to uh, downgrade to an older RSA key, uh, RSA key chain. And the nice thing about it is basically it only requires the server to support RSA key exchange. Even if you have a client that doesn't support this at all, we can still do this attack. Um, I think it was mentioned before, but um, using the um, the Blechenbacher attack, we're not uh, only able to decrypt messages, we're able to cause the server to sign messages. So we're able to sign the thermal Diffie-Elman keys. And uh, the nice thing about it is it also works on TLS uh, 1.3. It was already shown before. In fact, I think this is the only currently known possibility of a downgrade attack on TLS 1.3. Um, it, it does require an active man in the middle attack, which is a bit more complicated, but something we can live with. So the question is, do we have the cookies? And unfortunately for us, the, the answer is no. And uh, the reason for that is that uh, the TLS session has a timeout. When we start the TLS protocol, after 30 seconds, if the protocol doesn't finish correctly, the client will probably abort this, uh, this protocol. And uh, unfortunately for us, as we said, this, is, uh, this attack takes quite a, la a large number of messages. We can't finish it in under uh, 30 seconds. 
Okay, so um, the first uh, nice thing is that we can still try to do this attack on uh, Firefox. And the reason for that is that there's a way to uh, prevent timeouts in uh, Firefox TLS and check. I'm using something called TLS uh, warning alert, something that's known thing since the long gen paper. I think that they recently uh, decided to fix this, but something that's been known for several, uh, several years. So basically what we can do, we can do the man in the middle downgrade attack. It, we can keep the session alive for a relatively long time do, uh, during the, uh, the panic attack itself, and then we can finish the TLSN check after we decrypted the pre-master uh, secret. So we, do we get the cookies? And there's still one caveat left, and this is the problem that um, a user that's trying to access his bank account might notice that it takes more than 10 minutes for this uh, to website to, to load, and something that might uh, look a little bit fishy to the user. Okay, so we want to uh, be able to uh, still do the attack, so we use the beast attack. And uh, the beast attack is a very nice uh, idea, and basically says that if we can run JavaScript code inside the uh, browser of the user, this JavaScript code can try to even repeatedly open TLS connection to the bank account. Those, it, it can do it in the background. Uh, the same TLS is, will be sent to, uh, to the server, and we can do this attack, and the user doesn't need to know anything about it, which is something really, really nice. Um, and again, at the start of each connection, the same cookie is sent in the first, in the first packet, and so even if we have multiple connections, we only need to break just one connection. So, we have the cookie. Okay, so let's see what, how does uh, this affect the attack scenario. Um, now we're just going to attack uh, Firefox. So we have the same uh, uh, bank with the same HTTPS server, and now we have Mr. Smiley that, um, like me, uses uh, the Firefox browser, and he wants to access his uh, bank account. So access the bank account, and what he sees is that he doesn't have any money in the account. So Mr. Smiley is very, very sad right now, and what he does when, when the people are uh, in this kind of uh, despair is looking for the internet to, uh, to find uh, big prizes. But as we all know, uh, nothing is, uh, comes for free, and those um, sites usually hide a very malicious attacker. Uh, in this case, this is the Cookie Monster. And what the Cookie Monster does is sending this uh, malicious uh, JavaScript code to, the, to Mr. Smiley um, Firefox browser, and it now starts to try to reopen the connection, and the, the, and the Cookie Monster can try to do the in the middle attack. Again, we use the, the cat in the in the same uh, cloud provider, and we managed to get the cookies. Okay, so now we're very, very happy, but uh, we still have one problem, and the main problem is that um, I really like the Firefox browser. I think it's uh, have uh, very good quality uh, properties, and I don't want to attack only Firefox. I want to be able to attack all of the users. And in most browsers, we, don't, we couldn't find any way to try to um, delay this timeout, so we have only 30 seconds to finish the TLSN check. And the problem is that the expected number of queries that we need to, in order to uh, implement this Blackenbacher attack is, is very high. However, a nice thing that uh, we can see is that with a relatively low, probab uh, low probability, we might get really, really lucky. And the attack might be, uh, finish much sooner using a much smaller number of queries. So this is something that we can actually use. We can use the beast attack and try to rerun the attack multiple times, and again, we want to get a session cookie. We need to uh, be success successful just once. Maybe one out of 1,000 is really good enough. Okay, so can we use this to get the cookies? And unfortunately, still not. Um, but the reason is that we need at least 2,048 queries, as we said before, and we have time for about 600. So, um, unfortunately for us, we need st to do some more work. Okay, so um, let's try to parallelize this attack to make it go faster. Uh, many companies reuse the same certificate across multiple servers around the world. We want to have a server that runs in Europe and one in the US and one in Asia. And, we, and usually they use the same certificate in all of the servers. I'm not sure if there's a really good reason to do it, but it really helped us in any way. And uh, we can actually try to parallelize the attack across those servers. 
So each server is a, is a separate oracle. There's been many, many previous work that talk about how we can parallelize this uh, type of Leichenbacher attack. So is it enough to get a cookie? And again, the answer is unfortunately no, because as we said before, we need at least 2,048 sequential adaptive qu uh, queries. So we need to hear the response of the previous query before we can continue, and we, uh, we only have time for 600. So we can't do this uh, attack. So we need to find a way to uh, parallelize this attack in a new way. And before we start, we'll give a little bit of background about the, um, about the Manger attack. Um, the Manger attack is, again, um, padding Oracle attack against RSA. It's, uh, it uses a more powerful Oracle than the one that's used uh, in Blachenbacher. And the Manger Oracle looks something like this. We, we, the Oracle receives a ciphertext uh, encrypted with RSA. And it simply returns one if the topmost byte of the plain text is zero or not. Uh, this is it. And uh, it's more powerful because the chances that we'll, be, we'll find such a ciphertext at random is uh, one over 256, which is much better than the regular Blachenbacher Oracle that requires two bytes uh, in order to succeed. So we start uh, the attack with what we call the blending phase. We simply uh, generate random numbers, random uh, S values. We encrypt this uh, S value and then multiply it to the ciphertext. Um, due to the malleability properties of, uh, or maybe uh, semi-homomorphic pro uh, properties of RSA, um, the plain text is simply M uh, times S. And then um, if the oracle returns uh, one, then what we know is that M times S is smaller than two to the log two of n mi minus eight. We know that the eight top uh, bits are zero. So if this is the whole range of the possible values of uh, m times s, now we know that this topmost uh, part is, uh, is not possible, and we uh, narrowed our search range, which of course is still really huge. And the way that this attack continues is by iteratively reducing the possible interval where m times s lives in. And actually, after uh, doing maybe extra I sequential queries, what we have is that we know that M times S is in some smaller interval, which is here uh, denoted by a, a, I, and B, I. And then we know that there is some value, uh, R, I, that if you take M times S minus A, Y, this value is small. We don't know what the value R, I is, but we know that it's smaller than the, the size of the interval. And the way that this attack works, basically, we do a query. Each query removes about half of the um, possible range. And then we can decrease the range. And in the end, we know that we're somewhere in this uh, small, much sm smaller range. And in the full attack, what we do is we continue until this range becomes um, uh, size of one. And we actually retrieve the, uh, the plain text. However, um, in, our, uh, in our case, we don't have enough time to do it. So we can do only about 600 queries out of the required 2,000. So we still have a very, very large uh, range. So, and so the tech is not good enough. So what we're going to do is we're uh, going to use what we call the cookie lattice. And basically, let's assume that we can do this attack in parallel uh, with k attacks. And for each attack, we have a different uh, random s value that was used for the blending. So we have um, k uh, formulas uh, of, this, uh, of this format, where we have this uh, value that we don't know, but we know that it's very small, which equals to m times s minus the uh, start of the interval. And this is very similar to the very well-known uh, hidden number problem. And this is something that we know how to, uh, to solve using uh, lattices. So basically, um, finding m is reduced to solving the closest vector uh, problem in a lattice. We can embed this in the shortest vector problem of, uh, of a lattice and then solve it rel uh, relatively efficiently using LLL. And this is the lattice that uh, we create for, the, uh, for this attack. And uh, in the end, what we need is about uh, five servers to order to decrypt 2048 uh, bits RSA using this Munger, uh, Munger Oracle. So in the end, we get the cookie. Okay, um, but there is something that's a bit interesting about, about this. And the interesting thing about this is that this is not an optimization for the attack. This is a trade-off. 
Um, actually, the initial blending phase that we mentioned, the trying to find some value S that, is, uh, that Oracle um, returns uh, one on, is more expensive in some way per bit than the, than the other stages. So if we uh, want to run this attack in parallel, we actually require more queries than the original uh, attack needed. So what we get, so you can ask, why, why do we want to do it? So the reason is that it gives us a trade-off between the total number of queries and the number of sequential queries that we need. And this is allows us basically to finish the attack in under uh, 30 seconds. And the attack scenario now looks something like this. We have the same attack with the with same smiley, but now we used, um, uh, in this case, four uh, servers in parallel in order to run the, run the attack. We, we do the same attack as before. We get all of the results. We put them in the lattice, and then we have the cookies. Okay, so um, this is the full, uh, the full attack scenario. But so far, I didn't uh, mention it in a way. Um, what are the actual vulnerabilities of the Bleichenbacher attack? And actually, why is it so difficult to, um, to fix this uh, problem? It's known from 98. We still, uh, we still see it uh, uh, in 2019. And the reason is that it's very hard to reduce the, um, the time variability when you do RSA key exchange. So basically, in the, um, the main goal that we want to achieve is that uh, no matter what the uh, PKCS verification function returns, if it's one or zero, the TLS extension should continue in the same manner. Basically, in the way that we, um, the Brechenbacher original attack was mitigated in TLS was that if the uh, padding scheme uh, fails, then we generate a, a random key, and this is what the server used to continue the, the handshake. The handshake will fail in the end, but it will be very difficult for the attacker to know um, if it was because of the padding uh, that didn't succeed or because the random uh, key is not the, the key that was sent by the client. So we need to do it in a way that's very difficult for the attacker to differentiate if we use this random key or the, uh, or the original uh, key that was sent by the client. So this is something that's very, very hard to do in, with very low tempo uh, variability, but most of the implementations that we check manage to do it relatively, relatively well. However, it is very, very, very hard to implement this in what we call full constant time. Full constant time means that there's not a small vari time variability, there is no time variability. The, uh, the software actually behaves the same way no matter what the, the padding uh, check uh, returns. And as we've seen many times before, when we have pseudo constant time implementations, they're only uh, pseudo secure. And this is the reason we have all of this uh, uh, nice table. So in this table you can see that there are uh, uh, three different categories that we have the data conversion, the PKS verification, the TLS mitigation, which we consider there are three layers in the way that we want to mitigate uh, this type of attacks. And each, uh, each layer has its own type of uh, vulnerabilities. So we start with the data conversion. And what do we mean by data conversion? Basically, RSA decryption or encryption, as we said before, it's met, it works with uh, big integer numbers. However, the PKCS uh, padding scheme works with bytes. Also, this is, where, uh, this, uh, this is where the way that we handle the keys and the information that we want to encrypt. So we need to convert from one to another. So after, after we decrypt the, uh, the cipher text, we get a plain text number, and we want to convert it to uh, bytes. And this is, depending on implementation, might be a relatively hard uh, thing to do in constant time. And when we view the different implementations, what we found is um, most, uh, most prominent was a conditional padding with zeros. If the uh, decrypted number was small, we need to pad it with zeros in the top bytes. And this is something that was uh, actually very hard to do in constant uh, time. There was conditional branching on the exact size of the padding. And um, again, the timing uh, difference that was caused by this type of um, branches is actually negligible. It's very hard to measure it from outside. But however, um, we're using cache attacks is something that's sometimes very easy to find. For example, there was in one of the implementation a conditional call to memset if we need to um, set one or more bytes to zero. This is something that when you do a cache attack is very, very easy to see. And the vulnerabilities 
are very problematic here because they arise from very, very low level serialization function. This is something that the people that actually implement the TLS mitigation usually work in a very, diff uh, very different level. We've even seen cases which the, the TLS uh, Blackenbacher mitigation and this um, function were in different cryptographic uh, uh, libraries altogether. It's very hard to, uh, to understand that this is something that might hurt you in the upper layers. Uh, another layer of, of the attack is the ver uh, PKCS uh, verification itself. And this is a relatively complex check. It requires multiple valid validity checks. We need to check that the two top uh, most bytes are uh, zero and two. We need to check that we have um, a large enough number of random bytes until before we get the zero. We need to check the link of the plain text. All of these checks are um, done one after the other. And what we found is basically a lot of um, unconstant uh, behavior. Uh, for example, conditional calls to mem copy. So in some cases, we, um, the, the library only copied the plain text to the outside if the, if the, um, if the padding uh, is valid. Otherwise, they simply leave, um, leave the buffer alone. There were conditional rights to error log if the verification fails, conditional branching or the different validity checks which was nice because they gave us um, many uh, types of uh, more efficient Blackenbacher oracles. And again, timing difference is relatively negligible, but it's very easy to detect. Uh, okay, the last layer that we have is what we call the uh, TLS uh, mitigation. And as we said before, the goal is to uh, keep the same behavior if the verification uh, succeeds or fails. And if uh, the verification fails, we use a random key. So uh, on this layer, what we found is, co again, conditional branching on the verification result, conditional uh, memory accesses, and even in some cases, um, the call to the uh, random generator uh, function was only done if the verification uh, failed. And again, apart from this uh, random uh, key generation, which is actually takes what a long time, most of the attack uh, timer difference are neg negligible. Okay. So if we try to sum up uh, our results, uh, we show several um, techniques for micro-architectural -archi padding oracle attacks. We uh, found that seven out of nine uh, implementations that we checked were vulnerable. We show a proof of concept for the Mangar and Blachenbacher attack. We show how we can uh, boost the attack efficiency using uh, this type of uh, attack. And uh, we show how we can parallelize this attack uh, to do downgrade attack, and we have a proof of concept for uh, um, attack using uh, Manger Oracle and uh, NLLL. Okay, um, so uh, basically uh, the goal of this type of research is to help make the internet more secure. So the main goal is to try to fix this type of vulnerabilities. So we started a relatively long uh, disclosure, uh, disclosure uh, process. There were seven vendors that we tried to uh, disclose to. And um, from the beginning, we thought that this is going to be a relatively hard thing to, uh, to fix because of the wide range of, um, of layers that we needed to, uh, to fix in order to uh, close these vulnerabilities. So we decided uh, to give uh, 120 days uh, embargo period um, so to make sure that everybody will be able to, to fix it. And this is something that's relatively difficult because you have here um, some very large companies with people that are paid for and some uh, open source uh, implementation that there's one guy that does all of the coding on his own spare time. We need to somehow coordinate all of these uh, different uh, parties. Um, in the end, all of them have patched, uh, patched their code and with some various level of successes. We have some libraries that we think that didn't patch it well enough, but most of it, is, was, uh, it was okay. And I think we, we, sh we learned some lessons from this type of um, large disclosure uh, process. And I think that it's something that um, maybe we as a community need to try to think about how we do this disclosure process and how we um, make sure that the people we disclose to cooperate in a, in a good manner. And when you disclose to a specific vendor, then everything is okay. You can coordinate the time of the embargo. If it needs a little bit more time, you can try to extend it. If it fixes it very early, you can try to disclose sooner. But what happens if there's one company that wants to disclose in about one week, 
and then another company that says it's going to take uh, 90 days. Um, my belief is that we should gi uh, give the time for at least a reasonable amount of time for all of the parties to, uh, to have time to fix it. Uh, unfortunately, as we've seen, not all of the vendors that we disclosed to thought the same. And uh, we had for uh, one example, we had one of the vendors says, said to us that he's not, um, not willing to keep an, a long embargo period. He's going to uh, give us at most two weeks after we disclose it to, and then he's going to uh, do a public patch. And this kind of public patch is basically releasing a zero day on all of the other vendors that didn't patch it. Because it's not very, those attacks are nice, I feel they're, they're elegant, but they're not very complicated to understand, especially after you diff the source code of the changes. Um, with this vendor, it was very, relatively easy. We said, okay, so we'll contact you again in about um, uh, nine weeks, and then we'll disclose to you after all of the rest of the, the vendors they decided to fix. Uh, what happens was that after two months, he returned to us and said, okay, um, maybe I don't want to hear it now. And then we disclosed it, and then what happens is that uh, we discover that um, the, one of the vulnerabilities wasn't in a code that he's responsible, but some other open source library is responsible to. And then uh, we got a message from this poor guy that says, oh, uh, I'm doing it on my own free time. Um, you want me to do this entire large patch over uh, Thanksgiving? I need to have a, at least one week that, of unpaid vacation from work to, to do it. Is it possible to, do, to postpone the disclosure process? So again, because we think that the, the main, the main uh, goal here is to make the internet more secure, we ask all of the other vendors, are you able to uh, postpone it? And we postpone. Um, the one main issue that we had is that one of the companies, which I won't mention its name, although it has been mentioned uh, before um, uh, in previous talks, um, decided that they want to um, do a better test of the, um, of the patch. And then they called at some point and said, okay, two days ago, we already patched it and we sent, the, uh, we sent it as a better version to the uh, better channel for, for, test, for people to test. Uh, we claim that if, for example, I would be a kind of attacker that wants to find uh, zero days on product, I would probably try to uh, be on this um, beta tester list, try to get those, um, those early releases and see if there's anything interesting in them. And uh, the answer that we got was, yes, that is an interesting point, and, uh, but we don't really care. And in the end, I'm not sure that, uh, especially in this type of attack, it's not something that's very easy to implement in, uh, in practice, but I think that uh, I, for once, uh, will be uh, very careful in disclosing to this company again when we uh, are having multiple vendor problem. And it's something that I feel that we as a community should try to see how we can share this kind of information so um, maybe we can find a way to cause these companies to uh, behave uh, more nicely uh, in this type of uh, situations. Okay, and so after having said all that, uh, what are the recommendations that we have from this uh, type of attack? Uh, so in the paper, we have many ad hoc tactic recommendations how you can try to prevent this type of, uh, of attack in the different layers. But the bottom line is simply don't use uh, RSA key exchange. It's something that has failed us too many times in, in the past, and we need to find, and we have better alternatives. We need to find a way to actually deprecate it. However, if you really, 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 really must use RSA. The main thing to, to, to do is please separate your certificates. Um, in most companies that we, uh, that we check, they reuse the same RSA certificate both for uh, key decryption and for uh, signing. For, uh, and, uh, and this is what enables the, all of the downgrade attacks. If um, there will be separate certificates for decryption and for signing, and if uh, it will be possible to use different uh, decryption certificates in different servers, this will make this type of attacks um, not practical at all. But again, please just um, stop Blechelbacher. And this is something that we got uh, on Twitter as a response to the paper. Okay, and in, conclu in another conclusion, 
what we'll say is that uh, mitigating padding attacks on RSA is not something that's impossible. We've seen at least two libraries that were able to, uh, to do it, and I think that several libraries are now also uh, secure. But it's something that's very, very close to impossible. And um, I think that's something that um, mainly rests on people that design these cryptographic protocols, try to do it in a way that it's much easier for people to implement it safely. We're going to see another talk today about a similar, uh, a similar issue. Um, it's not fair to just say um, all of these problems are implementation problems and the, um, the programmers did something wrong. This is the fault of the people that designed the protocol. Protocol should be easy enough to, to implement. And if uh, you want, there's uh, the full paper and other information is in the website, and I will be happy to take questions. Thank you. Uh, hi. So, um, how did you actually find the cache side chain attacks? Was it many a code review, or is there something to cooperate into some continuous integration environment or something? Mm. I would really want to, uh, to, to say we have really excellent tools to do it automatically, but the answer is uh, okay. very long <laughs> manual code reviews. Okay, so next year, cut 10, yeah? <laughs> <laughs> Probably, yes. Are there any other questions? Uh, can you please repeat the question? The, um, they care about this. I think this is the main, the, the main thing. Uh, they did a lot of work to try to fix all of the vulnerabilities. Um, they forked out of OpenSSL, which were almost safe to begin with, and they just fixed something that, well, I think that the vulnerabilities for OpenSSL was something that was known to be a problem. They didn't think it was exploitable. Uh, but they know, and OpenSSL decided to, f to take the time to fix it. OpenSSL fixed it a little bit later. But uh, on the other end, um, uh, BearSSL uh, was written uh, from the start as something that's one to, uh, uh, supposed to be constant time, and the coder is much, much simpler, and, uh, and that's one of the reasons why they were able to do it. Okay, any other questions? Maybe I have a question, so uh, you have... Uh many experiences with uh, different uh, vulnerabilities in cache side channels. What is uh, easier to prevent, uh, CBC padding oracle uh, attacks or Black and Buffer's padding oracle attack? So, uh, depending on the uh, validation logic and Lucky 13 and this stuff. I think that Lucky 13, if you're willing to uh, pay not a very large uh, penalty in performance, mm -hmm. it's something that's relatively easy to fix and if you're, if you're willing to pay the price that it costs, it's either performance or the, to break some of the abstraction layers in the software, which is something that many programmers really, really hate to do. But if you're willing to do it, it's relatively easy to fix. Um, this type of attack, because it has very uh, many different levels of code that each one of them might affect the other, I think it's a much more complex uh, thing to fix. Okay. If there are no other questions, then uh, thanks, Eyal, once again. Thank you.